thank you for staying with us to the very end of the day. Uh, I'm Maureen, call me Mo, and this is Kelsey. And Kelsey and I um, met in 2009. Uh, and I want to tell you just a little bit about who Saving Sunny is so that you'll know what kind of an organization is behind the program we're about to tell you about. Um, in 2009, this beautiful dog, Sonny, was thrown off of a bridge that connected uh, Kentucky to Indiana into the Ohio River, eight stories. Miraculously, she lived. Uh, and while she was flailing about, trying to orient herself in the water, Kelsey was working at a nearby restaurant that was a riverfront. She and a bunch of other people ran to the riverbank, and fortunately, somebody saw a rescue boat doing training missions. They called 911. Brought, Kel brought uh, picked Sunny up in the water, brought her to the riverside, and Kelsey grabbed her up. And shortly after Kelsey grabbed her up, Kelsey was threatened with eviction. I had just come back from a best friend's training. It's how to start an animal <laughs> sanctuary. We didn't know each other, right? Woo! We didn't know each other, but I got a call from Lady Van Cavage, who I'd never met personally, who said, I understand you have a law degree. I wasn't even a practicing attorney. I understand you have a law degree. You need to call this young woman and help her. By the time I called her, she'd already handled it, which is not a surprise now that we know her, but she had already handled it. But what came from that meeting was the two of us deciding that something needed to be done. Our focus was on victims of crime, like Sonny. We thought that we were gonna work with the local police, but red tape was overwhelming when we tried to set up foster homes for victims of crime who were evidence in cases. But after spending a considerable amount of time in the shelters, <laughs> we realized that pit bulls were the ones who needed most of the help. And so we very quickly evolved into the first and the only pit bull rescue in the city of Louisville, Kentucky. <laughs> we were up and running in 2010, and our intent was just to start saving pit bulls. And as anybody who has tried to help pit bull type dogs knows, you instantly came face to face with judgment, especially in 2010, much has changed since then. But we came face to face with judgment and over the years really started to think of ourselves as people who knew what it meant to be judged. Or so we thought. <laughs> so as Mo uh, just said, we founded uh, our organization Saving Sunny in January of 2010. And, uh, and we really started doing kind of traditional rescue, which I'm sure many of you in this room are doing, which is incredible, so give yourselves a big pat on the back. Um, our goal was getting dogs out of the municipal shelter, which the shelter in our community is um, uh, open admissions, very high kill, it's a dangerous place, it was a dangerous place at this time, and still is, um, but things are better for pit bull terrier dogs. Um, so we had basically what I like to call um, revolving door fosters, um, which is a really amazing core group of foster families. They were volunteer families. Um, when we were putting dogs into their home, when we were pulling them from the shelter, we were working together to find them their forever families. And then as soon as those dogs got adopted, we pulled another dog from the shelter and put them in their home. So at any point in time here in about, um, 2010 to 2014, we had between eight and 20 dogs in our program. We were doing an average of three to five adoptions per month. And at the same time, an average of 13 dogs were coming into our municipal shelter every single day. Okay, so those numbers don't add up, do they? We were making a huge monolithic impact in the lives of these individual dogs. But where was the global impact on these numbers of shelter deaths, okay? How can we increase our impact? We started kind of looking at, you know, changing up our programs and, and uh, reducing the flow of dogs into shelters, reducing the chance of these dogs getting into the shelter doorstep in the first place, okay? So what we did is uh, we started to look at reducing shelter intake. Where do we start here, okay? So two things we looked at, data, very important. Um, we started looking at the zip codes of where these dogs were coming from, okay? Where were the owner surrendered pets coming from in our Louisville metro community? And was there a relationship between why the dogs were coming from this community or these communities, excuse me? Um, we started to see that there was in fact a relationship between these communities and the reasons why they were being relinquished to Louisville Metro Animal Services. And that was that all of the highest intake zip codes were also low income, high crime and generally underserved by our community. Um, and they were also really underserved by the animal welfare community. 
Okay, so we, we realized that these neighborhoods are what we call resource deserts. And resource desert means that the people that are living in these communities are literally stranded without assets or resources. These things can be access to veterinary care. Uh, we found out that one of our target communities only had one veterinary clinic that did not offer any low cost services within a 40 block radius, okay? Uh, very little access to healthcare advocates, very little access or no access to fresh produce, um, not a real grocery store even. Um, and most of these people living in these communities have no transportation, so they rely on public transportation. Um, and in our community, public transportation is absolutely horrific. Um, so they were actually relying on a system that was already working against them. Um, all of these neighborhoods tend to be overlooked by investment and growth strategies, and there are many other challenges related to poverty. Next thing we be began to look at in the resource deserts was the housing crisis. As Mo touched on, I was even affected by this pet-friendly or pit bull terrier-friendly housing. Um, this is happening in your communities just as it is like ours. Um, most public subsidized housing does not allow pets. Um, and some states across the country, some of your states have a criminal eviction statute, which means when people fall on hard times, when they get an eviction notice, they are a known criminal and they can actually do jail time. So what happens to those people when they have, or what happens to those pets in their homes? Three out of four families that qualify for any sort of assistance receive nothing. So the people living in these resource deserts are probably putting what little resources they have towards their human children, and we cannot fault them for that, okay? We have to get past the villainization of families that are relinquishing their pets to shelters as a very traumatic last resort. That is our job in animal welfare at this point. And I want you to start thinking about throughout this um, session what neighborhoods in your communities are resource deserts and are facing house housing crises, economic hardship, and high eviction rates. So as Kelsey mentioned, we start to examine different zip codes in different neighborhoods in the city of Louisville. And we find much of what she's talking about in terms of correlation between uh, obviously low income, joblessness, housing challenges, um, all of those things that seem to relate to high surrender rates exist in all of them. So how do we nail it down? How do we choose from these communities? Because we can't help them all at once. We are just trying to get this program off the ground um, with the help and support of Best Friends, which we'll tell you about later. But how do we pick them? What, are there any differences between these neighborhoods and is there one neighborhood that stands apart as the best place to launch a pilot? And so we started looking at, um, from a, a public standpoint, municipal facilities, libraries, community centers, other places where if we could entice local government uh, officials or services to be helpful and free, that we would try to find a location that was somehow tied to those. So we started looking, each of these neighborhoods had a government-run neighborhood center. Um, in most cases, it was very difficult when we scanned around to see if we could find private support, a private business that might lend us space, because in most instances, there were not private businesses in these neighborhoods. Most of these buildings were abandoned, so you weren't going to find a lot of people ready to roll out a warehouse for you to start working. So we needed to see what kind of informal um, connection we could find, and also what were the um, human aspects of those neighborhoods. For example, some of the neighborhoods tended to be more transient. People in, people being evicted, or people moving, or people ending up in jail, or whatever the case would be, um, that folks came and went. Neighbors didn't necessarily know each other. Um, neighborhood places could be uh, active and vibrant, or they could be uh, uh, nearly condemnable. There was a wide range of, of those experiences. So we ended up identifying a neighborhood referred to as the Portland neighborhood in West Louisville. And the thing that set the Portland neighborhood apart from the others for us was um, two or threefold. First, Portland is known as a historic little town right on the Ohio River, known for shipping, and it at one point was an economically vibrant city decades ago. So what Portland offered us was generations and generations of residents. So a lot of these folks grew up together. 
From block to block to block, it seemed like everybody knows each other, or at least everybody knows who's who. And as we learn later, everybody knows everybody else's dogs, <laughs> for sure, even if they're not sure about the human. And in addition, and um, very importantly, the Portland community has the Portland Community Center, which is extremely, compared to others, extremely vibrant, very much a part of the community, offers programs for kids, for the disabled, reading support, sports, you name it. Uh, they are also a center of information uh, and, and a point of contact for many, many, many folks in the community of all generations, from the kids to, to elderly folks. So we went and reached out to this community center and the folks who worked there couldn't get us in fast enough. You, we have such a problem and you are the pit bull rescue, oh my gosh. This neighborhood was also known for having some fighting ring issues, um, which is a whole nother conversation. But, th but the people who worked in that neighborhood said, you know, how fast can you do it? Now the government that runs it was not quite as quick. They need, I mean, we went through every variety of paperwork, waivers, insurance, uh, liability, promise us, promise us, promise us, you're not bringing any dogs up here, you can't bring dogs, what exactly are you doing? Kelsey and I must have described it uh, 50 times, and it was as simple as people check in, people get a name tag, they get their food, they get their flea tick, they go. But I, they were just so sure that we were gonna come parading in with big, dirty, nasty dogs. And um, so, so there was some trust building that went on and it was your usual bureaucratic process. It took us a couple of months, all told, to get into this, um, to this center. But once we got in, we immediately, by word of mouth, started finding connections to people and people heard that we were coming. And we started to familiarize ourselves with an area that a couple of our volunteers knew. Some of them were born here, some of them had family in the neighborhood. But by and large, most of us are outsiders. So this is the perfect image, to, a, a metaphorical image for us. This is the, if you can't read it, it says the Portland Grocery. And it is a, a working grocery. This is the Portland Grocery. So you can see visually what do your eyes and your brain tell you about Portland when you see that building. What you probably can't see from where you're sitting is the A, it has an A rating. <laughs> so whatever you see out here, inside, the heart and the soul of it, has an A rating. Great metaphor for Portland and great metaphor for what we find out. I will not go through all of these details, you can read them yourself, about the things that Kelsey already talked about, homelessness and crime, et cetera, but just another image of Portland, a little bit uh, more alive part of Portland. Um, but yeah, so we started to recognize a town that we had not known before. So thanks to a generous grant from Best Friends, we launched the Community Dog Resource Center. We call it the CDRC. Um, the goal is to reduce the canine shelter intake from this uh, particular zip code and surrounding zip codes through providing essential resources. And all these resources were reasons why people told us they were relinquishing their pets to the shelter. Um, you know, food bank, flea tick prevention. We live in the Ohio River Valley, so it is, uh, it is a really bad place for fleas and ticks. Um, and we all know uh, dogs going, out, going without prevention um, can lead to some serious problems that will eventually, a lot of times, land them at the shelter because people cannot control the health issues that come from that. So simple prevention can really p keep pets in their homes. Um, ID tags. We have a fabulous uh, ordinance in Louisville within the past two years it was established that whenever an animal control officer picks up a loose dog, if they are wearing an ID tag, they can return them to their home instead of impounding them and taking them to the shelter. That's amazing because a lot of times people will leave their pets at the shelter because they can't afford the impound fees. So that's something we can also assist with as well. But just that simple ID tag, providing them with that little, little piece of metal uh, is a really big deal. Spay neuter programs, which I'm gonna get into here in a little bit and behavior support, which is a huge part of our resource center. We offer free behavior assistance, leashes and collars, some training tools, uh, crates, um, and what we do is we go into families' homes and help them with 
behavior issues ranging from really simple, just walking on a leash. Um, sometimes that is the easiest fix for families. I'm sure you guys know, just learning how to walk your dog on a leash and give them a proper walk every day can really change the dynamic of your home with dogs. Um, so that's something we can do, even ranging from you know, dog aggression. Um, we can go in and help families integrate pets if they found a dog, if they're doing homegrown rescue, which we'll talk about here soon. So the behavior program is huge, and that is a, and that is a really big reason why people are relinquishing their pets to shelters. Um, so we're empowering these homes in underserved communities to keep their pets. So what we did is to start developing a plan as Maureen said, we found our location, the Portland Community Center. They were really happy to work with us, so we set up shop there. Um, once a month, we were going to uh, purchase and secure the donations of dog food and all the resources that we would hand out, um, coordinate with our low-cost spay and neuter clinic, which is the Kentucky Humane Society SNP clinic, fabulous program, um, to prepare for our transport from this neighborhood because we all know there's a really, um, really big transportation issue from these resource deserts. So being able to get these pets to the SNP clinic was a big deal. Um, and also to start promoting our first CDRC and kind of establish how things were gonna work that day. And you know, we weren't just arbitrarily handing out dog food to anyone that showed up. We had to establish a system so we could take proper data, so we could start developing relationships with these people that came and showed up to get the resources for their pets. So um, as I said, we had to start flyering the Portland neighborhood and we really had to kind of meet this community where they are. Most or a lot of these residents don't have access to internet phones, I know a lot of us are on social media, but a lot of people in this community are not, so even if we promote it on social media, they're not gonna know about it. Um, a lot of people in this neighborhood move frequently, so we can't necessarily bring the information to them. So a crucial relationship for us was the neighborhood paper. It's called the Portland Anchor. And as you guys can see over here on the right, uh, that was one of our ads um, when we were doing free uh, vaccinations and microchips with our municipal shelter. Um, so people knew that they could bring their dogs that day and come get some free resources. Um, so this was absolutely crucial for us to be able to communicate with this neighborhood because people in the Portland neighborhood really depend on the Portland Anchor to tell them what is going on in their community. So the, the first CDRC, after all of our preparedness and planning and, and making sure we were ready, um, the real education began. Um, day one was absolutely a chaotic collision of so many different things happening. It was uh, love and appreciation and tears and, and people coming up and hugging us and saying, oh my gosh, thank you so much. There's a, there's a big um, stereotype in the Louisville community that it's dangerous to go west of 9th Street. And uh, Portland is around, like the epicenter is about 27th Street. Um, so they were, uh, they were really, really grateful that we sort of surpassed that barrier and came down and they, they couldn't believe that we were doing this for their community. Um, in addition to the love and hugs and appreciation, we also saw um, intoxicated people at 11 a.m. Um, we saw people kind of getting in fights and tattletailing on each other um, because as Mo touched on, um, these people all know each other. They're neighbors, they're family, they're from this community. So they're very willing to come up to us and say, um, I heard Bob told you he has four dogs. He does not, he has three. <laughs> Um, so, you know, you've got people kind of saying, uh-uh, because they don't want anybody to take advantage of the system because they're going to start relying on it. Um, so it was a really, really big learning curve for all of us. And uh, our bleeding hearts do not judge people until we started saying some of these things to, our, to each other at the end of the day. If they refuse to get their dog spayed and neutered, they should not get any food. <laughs> Why do people get three dogs when they can barely feed their children? How can people live like that? That house was disgusting. I wanted to just pick up their dog and get him out of there. We need to refuse assistance to anyone that breeds dogs. And he wants food for an outside dog. Um, when he brings that poor dog in the house, he can get some food. So these are all things that, that at the end of this really emotional and overwhelming day, we started saying to each other. And uh, you know, we, we were the pit bull people. We were the people that had been screaming at the top of our lungs for four years, don't judge our dogs. <laughs> and this is what we were doing at the end of day one. <laughs> kind of ironic, huh? So uh, we had to check ourselves before we wrecked ourselves, right? <laughs> um, 
we started to form a new view of Portland. And uh, this is, uh, these are some murals that are in the neighborhood. And uh, I don't know if you guys can read this, but it says, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So that's, uh, that is really, really relevant in this community. And I can honestly say that through this evolution, I, I am honored to have been accepted into this community. And these people are my friends and my family now, and it is an absolute gift to know them. This is a young couple. Uh, their names are Jeremy and Ethan. They live in the Portland neighborhood. And uh, they're a really great example of some of our clients. Um, the little Shih Tzu guy on the left is Ruger, and the little puppy on the right is Captain. And they actually found Captain running loose in the Portland neighborhood, which is a, a big problem. There's a lot of loose dogs in this neighborhood. Um, and he was a little, he's a little rotty mixed puppy. And uh, they picked him up, they took him into their home, and they tried to find his owner to no avail. Um, so Ruger was not stoked about Captain being there. So he was not happy, and he was telling his dads, uh-uh, this dog got to go. Um, but they were like, you know, we can't find his owner. It's, he's so sweet, and we love him. Is there something we can do? So they caught wind of the CDRC's free behavior assistance program. They got in touch with us. Our behavior team was able to go over to their home, teach the puppy some manners. Uh, Julie taught the place command, right? Um, taught him the place command, which is a great resource if you guys don't use it. Um, and to give Ruger some space, he needed, you know, he needed the puppy to back up off him occasionally. Um, and I'm really happy to say that this is a member of their family now. Um, so they love this dog. Yeah. And that is thanks to the word of mouth in the neighborhood and the free resources that were available to offer. So as we got to know our clients, we started hearing some things. <laughs> Anyone tries to lay on my, a hand on my dogs and I'll kill them. Straight up kill them. <laughs> I worked for three weeks to get this little dog off the street. He bit me three times before I finally picked up his little trembling ass and took him home. He was just so scared. I didn't plan to have four dogs. How many people have said that? <laughs> But I, was about to, I wasn't about to leave that baby on the street. Something bad would have happened to him. So these are things that as animal welfare workers, volunteers, advocates, we all say to each other. We're not gonna leave a dog running around on the street. We're gonna take in dogs when we probably shouldn't. <laughs> and nobody's gonna hurt our dogs, right? So these are all things that we would say to each other. They love our dogs, they love their dogs just as much as we love our dogs and they are absolutely advocates for their pets. Um, and these are two of our really special uh, clients as well. This woman uh, that I'm talking to right here, her name's Victoria, she has um, eight adult pit bulls, and uh, it took a lot of trust building, um, but we've been able to alter every single one of them. And she is a, a really great friend now, and she's just hilarious. I think you can probably see her snapping in that picture, so. <laughs> So our learning process, we really started to evolve when we built relationships with these folks. Um, we learned that economic status has absolutely no bearing on how much people love their pets. We need to learn to talk about things that matter to our clients because this is how we build relationships and trust with them. Okay, I don't necessarily want to hear about Linda's bunion surgery for five minutes when we show up to the CDRC, but it matters to her and we want to build enough trust with her to be able to offer her our resources, including spay neuter. So if she feels comfortable enough to talk to me about those things, then I am definitely down to talk to her about it. And that dog rescue transcends economic status because so many people in this impoverished community that don't have the resources to rescue dogs are doing it every day. What people don't realize is that even the folks who can't afford their animals, care for them like they are their children. People think, oh, if you don't have the resources, why get the dogs? Because the dogs needed them. The dogs needed a rescue. They were in a bad situation. And if they just get this one little ounce of support, then the dogs they rescued stay with them. And they get to have that family member who they love. And they get to be reinforced for all the good that they're doing for those animals. And whether or not you're economically challenged, your loving home, will always be better than in a shelter. For many years, 
Our organization was um, working towards finding shelter dogs' homes. We started to find out that we were trying to plug the hole at the wrong end. Why not help families keep pets in their homes as far as basic resources that they might need, say neuter surgery. We also work very hard and spend most of our time now going out in the community to homes who are having behavior issues to help those folks keep their dogs so that we stop the flow or we, we lessen the flow of dogs into shelters. We advocate for all walks of life um, for equal treatment and that includes animals and humans. So people that um, come from underserved, low-income communities um, are given blanket stereotypes when in actuality it's a beautiful, vibrant community that you know just needs a helping hand here and there. So that's what we're trying to do. It's hard to explain until you're in it, but once you make a connection to the humans who want so badly to do the right thing for their animals, inspirational isn't even the right word. That is what will keep us going. So, <laughs> thank you. A local video company want, heard about the CDRC and wanted to do something for us, and that's what they produced. It was really lovely. And I so, promise I didn't have a Britney Spears circa 2007 meltdown <laughs> by shaving my head. You witnessed three colors in that video before, and that's real. Um, so what keeps us going and what were we referring to in that video? Something that you rarely ever hear the rescue community say. The people keep us going. The CDRC has given us an opportunity to step back and own the reality that if we're going to help dogs coming from these high surrender, uh, underserved areas, we simply have to help the humans. And that was not an easy concept for us to embrace, especially during the first experience that Kelsey described. Some people were breeding for money. A lot of people did not want to neuter their dogs. Kelsey will talk more about that spay and neuter um, efforts and campaigns. But these people are what keep us going. These are the people who cry when they drop their dog off for a night. These are the people who cry and wiggle when they pick their dog up. These are the people who save these, and none of these dogs were purchased or, or pit. every one of these dogs that you see is saved. And this is probably our best and favorite story. You might remember the quote that Kelsey mentioned. I chased that little dog for three weeks <laughs> and he bit me three times <laughs> until I picked up his tiny little ass and took him home. This is Marshall and that is Poppy. Poppy's her man, and here's the beauty of Marcelle. She embodies everything about our experience. When we met Marcelle, she came to a spay-neuter um, uh, day, and she came to us not because she'd been to the CDRC, but because she heard by word of mouth, because it's a close-knit community, and everybody knew the story of Poppy. So Poppy needed to have a little work done and have his business removed. She shows up, and we learn that she is dealing with stomach cancer, and that her adult bipolar daughter had just surrendered custody of her three children, Marcel's grandchildren, turned over to Marcel, all elementary age. And she's on disability, of course, because she's battling stomach cancer. So she can barely take care of her own challenges. Then she gets the grandkids. And what is she doing after she drops the grandkids off at school? Chasing Poppy. <laughs> and she brings Poppy home, and Poppy is now not only living like a king, but he also has an unfortunate seizure disorder that's costing us a mint every month. Because she doesn't hesitate. We're like, girl, you call us if you need us. And I'll tell you what, hey girl, hey Poppy's almost out of medicine. But this is what keeps us going. Um, and now let's get to, and I think we probably have to start moving uh, more quickly. What do we mean when we say judgment-free zone? It sounds so intuitive and so obvious, doesn't it? That we don't judge. We are rescuers. We don't judge people and we don't judge animals. Well, we did. We judged hard. And what we realized after that first day where Kelsey was sharing the conversation and the, and the, the quotes about people who are breeding and uh, people have more dogs than they can afford and people who won't spay or neuter and so on and so forth, what we realized was that if we want folks to come back next month, if we want to have a chance to have a conversation with them, 
we needed to get over ourselves because we were not coming into this community to find out whose dogs were in a questionable situation and rescue them. We were here to say, what do you need to be better able to care for your animals? Which means whoever you are and wherever you are, we accept you. We accept you. We might go home and cry ourselves to sleep, but we accept you. And we are going to get you what you need to whatever extent that we possibly can. So we're all talking together and we're saying, all right, we have got to let go of this so that when folks show up at the door and they're lining up and being checked in, that what they feel is support and what they feel is accessibility. As Kelsey was talking about, we go into people's homes for behavior consults. Um, sometimes we deliver food to folks who are shut in and can't make it to these things. We need for folks to trust us in order to be able to do that. We need for folks to trust us and be able to tell us when they think others or animals are in need, other humans. Um, so we need to start developing what we refer to and many you know, social scientists refer to as a cultural competence. We need to understand the where and the why of folks and respect them for who they are and not presume that the way that we run our lives or the way we take care of our dogs, usually because we are all slightly more blessed than these clients, that our way is the right way and any other way is the wrong way. So helping humans, helping dogs, I think I covered that, unless you wanna see Kelsey's hair again, there it is. <laughs> um, <laughs> so for us, it means all of these things that I just said about if we are going to create change that makes lives better for these animals and keeps these animals in homes, remember, that's the goal. We may walk in and say, oh my God, I would not let my child walk into this house. But you know what, that dog does not know if the house is dirty. That dog does not care if it's overcrowded. If that dog is loved, that dog is happy, and we needed to really get over ourselves about that. So no matter what, we can all agree that in a loving home, however low income and however challenged economically, any loving home is better than being at a shelter that leans toward high kill, especially if you're a pit bull type dog. So these are the key elements, respect and trust. And I'll, I'll try not to repeat myself over again, but the idea here is, is that particularly in these communities where folks are used to being judged and ignored and left out, we had to come in and not say, here we are. Ain't we great? We are experts in whatever. We're experts in behavior. We're, we're all quasi-experts. None of us are experts in anything. We all do something else with our lives. We're all volunteers. So we don't come in like we're here to save you. We're here to fix your lives. We are not. We are here to lend you a little bit of a helping hand because we all love dogs just as much as one another. So we share this. We get you. You're our people. And the minute that they started to feel like we are their people and they are our people, then the trust develops. And with trust, we're able to then grow some really, really essential components of our program. Mm. So the best example of our dynamic of trust building and being judgment free is spay neuter. I heard Karen Little say something really poignant yesterday in her uh, presentation. It was that none of us have patience when it comes to saving lives. And she's exactly right. But in this scenario, we have to have patience. We have to be accepting. And I've heard a lot of people ask us, what, why are you giving people free stuff if they're just gonna go breed their dogs? Because if we say no, they won't come back. They will not come back after day one. And we can keep building relationships with them. We can keep talking about it. We can keep asking our spay and neuter coordinator, Michelle. She asks every single month, well, why not? Why not? And we want to hear from them. We want to create a conversation. We want to have a dynamic talk with them and understand where they're coming from. And a lot of times, it's the common myths that surround dog sterilization. A lot of times, it's that they don't want to be away from their dog for one night. They love their dog so much, they don't want to sleep alone. They have so much compassion and love for their animal that they can't stand the thought of us taking them away for one night. And that is, that is really true dedication and love. I'm sure many people in this room feel this way. We're all away from our pets right now, and we're like, oh my gosh, I can't wait to sleep with them again tomorrow night. You know. Um, so that is absolutely, we have to be conversational, not accusatory. We have to just create a constant conversation with them. And if every single month they come back and tell us no, that's okay. But we're gonna talk to them about it again the next month. And the best advocates that we can have are our community members. 
because they'll come up and they'll be standing in line and Michelle will say, well, why don't, why don't you want to sign up this month? And we'll have Mary in line right behind him saying, yeah, why not? It's word of mouth, you know, and they'll start to advocate for our program as well. I mean, like, like Mo said, Marshall, who, by the way, cooked us soul food and we got to drink malt liquor with, and she taught us how to shake our butts because apparently we didn't know how. Um, <laughs> I knew how, Kelsey. She's, I didn't know how, apparently. Um, <laughs> Marshall found out about our program through word of mouth from community members, so they are really our best advocates. So one of the most crucial parts of our program is our relationship with the Kentucky Humane Society SNP Clinic. And this is a, fa a fantastic billboard that was actually sponsored by Best Friends um, for some free pit bull sterilizations. And there was, uh, there was one in the Portland neighborhood as well. So it was a really great way to get the word out. Um, and we have to make it as accessible as possible, break down the barriers that these community members are facing in every way possible. So we have a really, really great access to a church in the Portland neighborhood neighborhood that is also, just like the community center, um, an epicenter of the community. It's called St. Cecilia. So we're able to use this, uh, this parking lot every single month to have people show up, bring their pets in the morning. Then we have the Louisville Metro Animal Services Rough Riders truck, which is a big transport vehicle. This is another um, example of working together in your community to get things done with other organizations. Um, they come, they help us load up all the pets, all the dogs on the truck, and we take them to the spay neuter, the SNP clinic, and then the next morning we bring them back to the same place. If for some reason the community members can't get to St. Cecilia, be it any barrier they have, a disability, um, if they have to get to work, if they have to get their kids off to school, we will find a way to come pick up their pet from their home and get them to St. Cecilia onto the spay neuter truck. Um, so we have to help these community members overcome barriers. We have to keep conversations with them on this morning too. Sometimes we have community members that struggle with illiteracy. So we have to walk up to them with the paperwork and, and fill it out together. Make sure that they are gonna be able to fill this out and get all the information. Okay, we wanna get the microchip information correct and you know really just come at it from a judgment-free standpoint. Another aspect of our Community Dog Resource Center is our courtesy posting program. I'm sure that many people in this room get calls and emails all day every day about people re needing to rehome pets. So we have to come, we have to come at that from a judgment-free place as well. So there's a lot of reasons why people are gonna be rehoming their pets. Sometimes it's their personal pet that they need to rehome for whatever reason. Um, or sometimes they're homegrown community rescuers and they picked up a dog off the street or from a bad situation and they would like help rehoming that pet. And that is something that we can absolutely do with little to no work. Um, a lot of times people are living in poverty and they have to make the choice to give up their beloved pet to put food on the table and we cannot pass judgment for that and we're going to help them rehome that pet. Um, if you guys have pet finder and adopt a pet, you can do that too. All you need is just to ask them for their photos, a description of their personality. Um, do they need help kind of evaluating where this dog is as far as what kind of home he or she could go into? We can help with that. Do they need to be spayed or neutered, vaccinated or microchipped? We can help with that. Um, and as you can see, these are two um, courtesy posts that we had up on our social media and they got so much traffic. I mean, people share these things out the wazoo and both of these dogs got adopted through social media shares. So it really saves lives and it empowers rescuers. Um, and we have to advocate for the human's interest as well. If this pet is not working out in their home, that is okay. We gotta advocate for their interest and the, the interest of the animal. And uh, so, so we started to see that this program worked um, and we started getting really, really big success. And uh, this, uh, this face right here is the reason that, you know, I'm an advocate for the underserved and for victims of maligned oppression. And, you know, I want you to think about right now, think about your heart dog. You know, think about that animal, heart, dog or cat, excuse me, that really changed everything for you. That's the reason that you got here today. Would that animal judge another person based on their race, their gender, their sexual orientation, or their socioeconomic status? No. Okay, so I try to be more like her every single day. <laughs> every day. 
So this is a, an infographic based on our first full year. We, we actually started uh, May 17th, 2014, we opened our doors. So we had data from about a little over six months, and then this was our first full year in 2015. So I'm sure you guys can read this, but uh, we offered 200 vaccinations, 39 behavior consults, 100 spay-neuter surgeries, 27,000 pounds of dog food, 76 hours with a lot of spectacular volunteers, 19 events which resulted in a 20% drop in owner-surrendered pets from the 40212 zip code, which is the Portland neighborhood. And this is just, just to give you an idea, this is kind of an average of what we're serving. Uh, th these numbers transcend pretty currently. The rest of the numbers are up significantly, but we serve about an average of 202 dogs per month. Uh, and those are owned by an average of 68 families per month. So that can kind of show you these are all, most of them are multi-dog households. Um, so this just really shows that this is what you can achieve if you go and start community outreach in your community. It is not going to take much to get programs like this off and have serious results. Um, and I cannot stress enough keeping track of this stuff. It's really, really important to maintain funding, to be able to apply for grants, is you have to keep track of as much as possible and make sure that you have all that information accessible for grant makers and, and other community members that might want to contribute to your programming. So we've learned a lot of lessons and we're always learning every day, um, and we have some plans for the future. Um, we are supplementing, we do not sustain. So um, we do not provide dog food for all of the pets in community members' home for the entire month. We're supplementing, we're assisting. They do have to have some accountability somewhere. So we've gotta make sure to advocate for them, but they've also gotta take some responsibility as well. Um, and one thing that's been really fantastic about the CDRC is that we've been able to open our doors to other groups that really makes our job easier. So um, our friends at Metro Animal Services show up every month with their ID tag machine. So that's not something that we've had to purchase yet. So they come, they're doing ID tags for all the residents. Our friends at Alley Cat Advocates show up because even though our resources are, are uh, only for dogs, a lot of these, if not all, know about community cats or a cat colony, and they need more information on those programming, those programs, excuse me. Um, so we, we have Alley Cat Advocates that comes every month, passing out information, talking to residents, getting feedback from them, and they're learning about TNR programs that can, uh, that can be implemented in Portland. So where do we go from here is now the question. We, um, this program was made possible by Best Friends uh, Animal Society and still is to this day. And uh, two of the Best Friends team who have been our family and support are in the house, Logan and Nikki, uh, who, <laughs> who provide us not just with the, the financial resource that was needed to get us moving, but also the guidance and the understanding of data and how it works and all of those things. So it really does take a team well beyond, certainly the two of us and our other Saving Sunny folks in the audience. But what do we do now? When we started the conversation about the CDRC, our initial hopes were that number one, we would stay for a couple of years and develop local leadership so that we would grow up from the Portland community, folks who we could hand it off to, still support and still help with resources and so on, but who could manage it on a given Saturday so that we could move to the next neighborhood. And what we have found so far is that that is an enormous challenge, um, in part because of all the great things about the community and how they're all family, and how at any moment they could bust into a brawl because somebody took an extra bag of food. And so, so we haven't really cultivated leadership in the way that we hoped we could. And that's an ongoing conversation. So where we are now is, do we have regular volunteers who have been coming to the CDRC for us, who may only do the CDRC, who are not part of the internal um, leadership body of Saving Sunny, can we grow them into the leaders that we need? So that's, that's still um, being discussed. Now we're looking at, is it time to start moving to another neighborhood and take this template and see how it works in another neighborhood that is equally challenged, but with perhaps very different social dynamics and uh, less infrastructure? Or do we want to uh, take the opportunity that we have been given to get a vehicle 
and take the CDRC mobile for a little while and see what happens if we're going to people and not just transporting animals to spay and neuter, but bringing the show right into the block where people live. So we're, we're discussing that and trying to figure out what is it that, that we want to do next. The other thing, a uh, couple of things, are that we have been, we have enjoyed many, many donations, particularly of food. Uh, when we were just getting uh, off the ground, Logan called and said, there's going to be a truck. Where do, I, where do I send it from Blue Buffalo? And she meant a semi, an 18-wheeler. <laughs> when someone says truck, we think dilapidated pickup truck. And she, you know, it was beep, beep, it's coming in. So, so we had donations to get us off the ground. Then we started buying um, literally one ton of food for each CDRC, one ton of food a month from, uh, from Sam's because it's incredibly, it is not the quality we want, but it is incredibly uh, low priced. And so we're able to get uh, that out. But we need to start finding better donation sources, um, especially locally, uh, and more sponsorship and funding from local folks. Because at some point, we've got to figure out a way to make this operation self-sustaining and not grant dependent. And that is, uh, that is a really tough challenge too. Because one of the things we found out is that um, if we are asking people for help with um, homeless pet owners, with the homeless community, there's a rally cry for the homeless community, which is fantastic. But poor people, not so much in our experience, that, that, um, that as we knew when we started, there tends to be more judgment. So we are still learning to communicate what we have just shared with you today about judgment free and how do we move the rest of our community in Louisville to that, or for that matter, the rescue community, um, because we still have work to do there. So, so these are all things that we're still looking at. Um, uh, every, every month is a new learning process, um, but it's always worth it. And just one last example, this woman owns a dog that we love so much, his name is Hooch. And he is a ginormous American bulldog, who as we were going into homes for behavior, um, Michelle was trying every month, get that dog in here to neuter him, get him in here to neuter him. No, we're not doing that. We're not gonna emasculate him. No, I don't breed him anymore, but no. We started going into homes for behavior visits, and it seemed like every home had a giant white American Bulldog. <laughs> and they'd come running out, they're the, the greatest, I mean, he's got some super fine DNA. But they'd come running out, and whoever was in the house would say, is that a hooch offspring? Oh, yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and then they'd tell us who the mama was, and you know, she was tied out in the yard in his house. So, so hooch had propagated I mean, the whole neighborhood had Hooch family. <laughs> and, and anybody who meets Hooch would want a Hooch baby, but that's neither here nor there. So, so Hooch, um, eventually, because of uh, relationship building, because of d respect, 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 you can imagine how badly we wanted to grab this woman and shake her for the first couple of months. Respect, respect, respect. You can even see those are probably the initial conversations. Look at our faces. <laughs> Look at our three faces. Are you kidding? God. And she lives a stone's throw. Her, you can almost see her house from back here. She's right there near the center. But she eventually brings Hooch in and gets him neutered. And he, oh my God, 30 pounds overweight, the worst allergies and skin issues you can imagine. This poor dog needed a lot more than just a neuter. And over time, he gets his neuter, and then we start helping try. In fact, I thought Logan even sent her some stuff because Logan mm -hmm. met Hooch and, and what a hot mess he was. So then we all became invested in his overall health and what does he need and prescriptions and this and that. She brought Hooch back a, uh, two months ago just for us to see him, and he'd lost over 30 pounds. His skin looked great. It was, it was fantastic. And she's in tears. And she's a tough lady. She spits nails. She is in tears because Hooch is going to live longer. And Hooch is living in a home with, I don't know, 100 children. Um, <laughs> and when he runs into the kitchen, chug, 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 they all jump on him and hug him. You know, I, there's so much love in this home. And they get Hooch longer, and she realizes now, and everybody in the community knows her, that we are good people, that we're her people, because we saved her dog's life. In fact, took him to the ER one time. Yeah. Um, when he, you know, was breaking down completely. So I think so, we went out for drinks that night yeah, <laughs> in celebration when, yeah. when he showed up and had lost 30 pounds and was running around yes. like a healthy, happy pup. Yes. I mean, there is no end to these stories. And as we've said over and over again, it keeps coming back to the humans. And behind all of these humans are all kinds of stories that 
we would be tempted to share and show you all the dogs and carry on for another two hours. But, um, but really, it is about the people. And it's about the fact that we let go of these expressions you see on our faces. <laughs> right? Now when we see her, we all run to hug her. It's a, it's a, it's a great evolution. So. So that is it. So what we know now is that as we move on, we can rest assured that our formula, <laughs> that our formula helped to overcome the stereotypes that were standing in the way of this community and their love for their dogs. And they are now staying in homes at higher numbers and we hope we can spread it further. And before we close, I forgot to mention this um, PowerPoint is slightly different than the one that was loaded up on the website. Yes. So, um, so if you want this one, we can load it up on our website, uh, on Saving Sunny's website next week, and maybe we can mm -hmm. email it to people. Yeah, we can definitely email it. We have business cards, so just come grab yeah. a card and we yeah. can absolutely email it to you. Yes. And I would love, love, I know you guys don't like to be in front of people, if you guys, are, my, the rest of my Saving Sunny team would stand up and get an applause because this, this program would cease to exist without these guys. <laughs>